Hi everyone, I'm Ludum Taters. You can call me Taters. In today's Power Index video, our focal champ will be the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury. In addition to Fury, we'll take peeks at the second baddest mother effer in the contest, Blade, Falcon, and three old heads, Falcon's Disney Plus show co-star, Winter Soldier, the marksman with purple lenses in his shades, Hawkeye, and original Black Widow. Also, a first for this series, but something that will happen from time to time as needed, I'll be adjusting the scores for two previously graded champs, Groot and Kamala Khan. So let's start the show. Nick Fury is a skilled champion of the defensive utility subclass. The first stat is Practical DPS. For my definitions of each stat, reference the description box. Fury's base attack rank is 94 out of 173 total champs, 18 out of 28 skill champs, and in the 50th percentile between game low and game high values. He's the median. His crit rate, however, is tied for second highest in MCOC behind Elsa Bloodstone and is 31% without any masteries, so excluding precision. He crits a lot, about one every three hits. His crit damage is low, only about a quarter of his base attack value, but the bulk of Fury's damage comes from bleeds and his Fury buff, so let's talk about those. Fury has a simple, guaranteed bleed mechanic with a few variations based on the player's intent and or preference. Every medium attack inflicts a 6 second bleed. The damage on the medium hit bleeds is negligible, but has a function which I'll get to. Each heavy attack inflicts 3 bleed debuffs whose DPS is identical to his medium bleeds, but they last for 12 seconds. Each combo ending light attack inflicts a quick 1 second bleed that gashes for nearly 1400 damage with a rank 3 6 star, 45% of his base attack. And finally, his SP2 causes 4 bleeds, each of which deals 750 damage over 8 seconds. When Fury has accrued 8 bleed debuffs on the opponent, they're converted to an internal bleed passive, which deals 270% of his base attack as bleed damage over 30 seconds, and he can stack internal bleeds. Hitting a defender suffering from any bleed damage raises Fury's crit chance by 25% of its native rate, up from 80% of Elsa's value to 99.6% of it, from 3 crits per 9 hits to 3 per 8. If fighting a foe who can bleed, the average damage per hit on standard medium, light, 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 medium, fury combos is about 6% higher because of both medium bleeds, which would increase his attack rank by 78 spots, from 94th to 16th, excluding internal bleed. With an internal bleed, assuming two full combos and 10 second stretches, the average damage per combo would match the expected damage per combo of a champ with the 8th highest attack value. The average damage per hit on a light ending combo is 15% higher than his base attack would warrant on its own and would place him 8th. Makes you wonder if Kabam built Fury in a way that gave players a choice on how to play him. So to sum up his bleed effects, there are basically two ways to utilize them. One, repeat a light ending combo, medium attack followed by four lights, to get his big burst bleed on every fifth hit. Or two, build bleed stacks to inflict an internal bleed passive. In short fights, the first method is probably most advisable. In longer fights, such as in Act 6 or Abyss of Legends, the second method is likely to net you a faster takedown. But both produce a damage output that by itself is top 10. But he's also got a fury mechanic. Like, obviously. What a catastrophic missed opportunity if he didn't, right? It's called Fury's Fury. A bit on the nose, but the silliness is actually kind of perfect. Nick gets his patented fury buff two ways. By accumulating 20 tactical charges, a mechanic we'll discuss in a later category, under which circumstances it lasts for 10 seconds before expiring, and by shedding his life model decoy, aka by losing all of his initial health so long as he's awakened and has a persistent charge. When his decoy is gone, the fury he gains is indefinite and less nullified. The value of this fury buff is exactly double his base attack. Adding one of these furies to his base attack nets a total attack rating of nearly 9,000. 2.35 times higher than the best natural rating in the game. If your LMD is gone, you can stack a second fury buff through tactical charge buildup, netting you a truly insane 15,000 attack rating for 10 seconds. 3.9 times more destructive than Dr. Doom's base attack. 4x. And his SB3 grants an attack bonus equal to Fury's Fury if he already has a fury buff active and or if the opponent is suffering from an internal bleed. Both scenarios. So let me paint you a picture. It's a beautiful and violent picture. Shed your LMD, inflict a 30 second internal bleed, build to 20 tactical charges, launch your SP3. What does that picture look like? 
it looks like an attack rating nine times greater than his base value. Nine. We're up to an eight in this category, but all of that probably makes it sound like he warrants a higher tally. Here's why I'm leaving it at an eight. Losing your LMD comes at a great sacrifice to sustainability. More on that shortly. And gaining a fury from tactical charges only provides 10 seconds of boosted attack, then would require you to clear your charges and rebuild to 20 to gain it again. This is an example of why I included practical as a qualifier for this category. Reaching Fury's maximum DPS isn't practical and probably isn't the smartest way to play him outside of a single fight against an opponent with massively increased health. In War, Alliance Quest, and any quest path on which you intend to use him for multiple fights, he's an 8 out of 10. Fury's health, armor, and block proficiency are right around the 40th percentile, moderately below average. But when he loses all of his health, he discards his decoy and his health starts again from 100%, then degenerates until he has 30% left. Adding 30% of his health to his listed health nets him 52,600 HP, which ranks second in the game, ahead of mammoths like King Groot and Man-Thing. When his LMD is destroyed, all detrimental effects, including passives, are removed from Fury. This is unaffected by ability accuracy modification. And for approximately two seconds during the transition from decoy to real nick, he ignores all incoming damage. Furthermore, while in his true form and with 10 tactical charges, knocking down the opponent purifies all detrimental effects. He purifies all non-damaging debuffs on knockdown when in decoy form. 7 out of 10 in sustainability. Like Captain Marvel last week, Fury has no legitimate power control abilities, but can tank an SB3 of any damage amount as long as his LMD is still intact. That earns him one point. Nick's utility comes from his SP1 and his tactical charges, which provide different effects based on how many he has. He gains charges by being struck, one charge per hit received except against mutants, and with his SP1, which awards four charges. Against Avengers, he starts the fight with six charges. If he has between one and nine charges, he loses a charge every six seconds, if he has 10 or more charges, he loses one every 4 seconds. The timer on his charges is paused for as long as he has his fury buff. So with LMD removed, he keeps his charges indefinitely or until he eclipses 20, at which point they reset to 0. At 5 charges, his attacks can't miss or be evaded. At 10 charges, he purifies all detrimental effects when knocking down the opponent. At 15 charges, he becomes fully unblockable and at 20 charges, he activates his Fury buff. On top of adding four tactical charges, his SP1 inflicts a potent disorient for eight seconds, which reduces defender block proficiency by half and reduces defensive ability accuracy by 70%. For comparison, Hitmonkey's disorient reduces defensive ability accuracy by 40%, and Massacre and Night Thrasher's inflicts a 50% reduction. Four points in utility. Fury has no immunities, but his ability to purify all debuffs instantly is a valuable offset. I'm only going to give him a 2 here, however, and the reason is that his purify is only achievable if he loses his LMD or completes a knockdown with 10 or more charges, and it's not super easy to build that many unless his LMD is gone already. To play Nick strictly for his utility and mix that with the internal bleed damage strategy is to play him at his most complex. But even then, you're just throwing standard combos and mixing in SP1s to build tactical charges. And it's normal for top-end players to play Nick for his heaviest short-term damage, which is parry and combo ending with a light attack. Fury scores a 4 here. Nick Fury's overall score is 7.97, stronger than I expected it would be. That sneaks him into Tier 7, the skill class's only top-tier representation. For a stretch of six months, from October 2017 until Corvus debuted in April of 2018, Blade was the most coveted champ in MCOC, and for very good reason. He's a heavy hitter and one of the game's most reliable bleeders, has phenomenal sustainability, solid utility, and requires little effort to master. And frankly, he's just cool as hell. His base attack ranks in the top 25%, and his special attacks are shredders. His SP1 inflicts two bleed stacks, each dealing the equivalent of his base attack and direct bleed damage over 10 seconds. His SP2 gains a 3.5x crit chance, nearly 80% to crit, and deals 460 direct bleed damage on each crit of its absurd 9 strikes, and his SP3 inflicts three huge bleeds, which collectively top 11,000 in direct bleed damage, 
4.2 times his base attack and has a 70% chance to stun for 3 seconds. He also bleeds defenders on parries at a 100% chance for 30% of his base attack. When near a bleeding opponent, his power increases by 7% of a bar per second. And on SP2s, he instantly gets 8% of a bar of power per bleed stack he applies. With the ability to administer substantial bleeds on command and gain power from them to recycle his specials, he can mow down opponents pretty quickly. But his most valuable abilities, in my opinion, fall under the sustainability category. Holding three bars of power, he shrugs off all damaging debuffs 95% faster, and his regeneration is the fastest and maybe the best in the entire game. He can regenerate 5% of his total health per second per quarter of one bar of stored power, or 20% of his total health in only four seconds per full bar of power. And lastly, as you know, he gets Danger Sense against Dimensional Champs, which reduces their ability accuracy by 40% and grants him an 80% attack boost. But Power Index doesn't acknowledge synergies, and without them, Danger Sense only applies to six champs, less than 4% of the contest characters. Blade's final is a phenomenal 7.66, currently tied for the highest score outside of Tier 7. Falcon's damage potential is pretty decent. He's well above average in attack and crit rating, and at max sig, dashing back and holding block for 2 seconds boosts his crit rate to equal the best in the game, which is 36% of hits. Performing the same action also reduces opponent defensive ability accuracy by 100% for 12 seconds at max sig, or 14 seconds at max sig against science champs. Its cooldown after expiration is 10 seconds. No compatibility with suicides, no power control, some minor offense utility on his SP3 that doesn't contribute to his score, and he lands at a 4.84, top branch of the bad tier tree. Winter Soldier is a true OG, one of the 25 inaugural champs of MCOC's launch. With that comes delicious simplicity. His damage is an even 6 on account of bleeds from his specials, plus his random fury buff activation which boosts his attack by 50% for 7 seconds once in 9 landed hits on average. Sustainability is below the median, playability an automatic 5, and he gets a point in power control because he can drain up to 27% max power at a 15% chance on critical hits. But his natural crit rate is only 23%, so his odds to power drain without any mastery enhancements or synergies is less than 1 in 25 total hits. 4.84, same as his buddy Falcon. Hawkeye is another OG. His attack and crit rate are above average, and his specials deal big bleed damage, including an SP3 hemorrhage whose total bleed damage tops out at 38,000. His SP1 drains 40% of the opponent's max power, equal to Vision's SP1 power burn, one of the best and easiest in MCOC. His health, armor, and block proficiency are all low, and unfortunately pull his overall score down to a fair 5.78, two tenths of a point away from tier 5. So, tier 4 it is. Finally, original Black Widow. Another early champ, as easy to understand and play as it gets. Her attack and crit rate are in the 60th percentile, and all special attacks give her crit chance an 8 second boost that would top Elsa's game leading rating, and a crit damage boost, also for 8 seconds, that surpasses Vulture's MCOC best by 16%. With a frequent special attack rotation, she hits really hard. She also reduces defensive ability accuracy by 80% at max sig against non-mutants, and by 95% against science champs, making her an extremely versatile attack option and her SP3 has a 70% chance to stun for 3.5 seconds, a tick longer than Blade's SP3 stun. Like Hawkeye, she squanders her spot in the tier above her due to risky sustainability metrics. 35th percentile in health and armor, 28th percentile in block proficiency. 6.02 overall, tier 5. Before we look at the updated tier chart for all classes, I want to make two score corrections. In last week's video, Groot scored a 3 in DPS and Kamala scored a 1 in Utility. My Groot vocabulary quip was my favorite line of the Captain Marvel video, so it's a shame it won't carry accuracy from this point onward, but I'm reducing his damage score to 2 points from 3. He's the 30th lowest champ in raw attack, and literally every champ below him can improve on their rating through damage over time effects, armor breaks, nullifies, or significant fury buffs. As mentioned last week when scoring him, his only attack boosting mechanic is a fury that's entirely dependent on defender AI or allowing the opponent to hit him. Simply put, Groot's attack is the worst in MCOC, and his score should reflect that. 
He's the only sub-3 in power index, and his overall score sinks deeper into the dirt, down to 3.59. Kamala gets a plus 1 in utility because her specials, which are written to remove only armor buffs, actually remove any opponent buff. And it seems Kabam was made aware of this years ago and chose to leave her as is, which, cool. Her score increases from 5.39 to 5.70, not enough to graduate to the next tier, but too important to go unchanged. Here's the current chart for all classes. Higher scores on the left, ties are conjoined in alphabetical. Five classes up, five down. It's been a solid launch to the series because of your support. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked the video or agreed with the assessments, drop a like for me. If you didn't, let me know why in the comments. Subscribe if you want to get notifications about new videos or participate in the premieres for this series. And do me a favor and share this video link in at least one of your line chats or Discord servers. Next week we move to Mutant Kind, and the main breakdown will be of Rogue, who narrowly lost this week's vote to Omega Red, but who has more votes overall from previous weeks. The episode will premiere next Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern Time. The community nominations won't be class specific for the next video, so leave a comment with any playable champ you'd like to see indexed or like someone else's nomination of that champ. See you all next week.